enzyme inhibitor worksheet. We'll be going over um, the rather complicated topic of the enzymes and enzyme inhibitors. If I can get to full screen. Let's see what we can do here. Okay, there we go. All right, folks, so um, we're talking about metabolism, all the chemical reactions that occur within cells. And within cells, we require organic catalysts. And you remember from chemistry, catalysts are things that speed up chemical reactions without being um, permanently altered nor being used up so they can help um, increase multiple chemical reactions per second. So when we're talking about speeding up a chemical reaction, um, I think we're going to use the term reaction rate. And reaction rate is the number of products, and products per unit time. So let's say number of products per second. So when we talk about speeding up chemical reactions, we're talking about increasing the reaction rates. So we're going to make more products and products per second using our enzymes or organic ca catalysts. We'll see in subsequent slides that the way the enzymes speed up the chemical reaction is by lowering, reducing the activation energy E sub A. And there'll be another slide about this on this topic. And as we mentioned, as organic catalysts, enzymes are not used up, nor are they permanently altered, and they can be reused over and over again. And our enzymes are protein catalysts, protein catalysts. <clears throat> we say the enzymes are um, sensitive to denaturation, so everything that would denature a protein will denature an enzyme. So um, high temperature, um, extremes of pH, um, heavy metals will all cause denaturation of our enzymes, extremes of pH. And another property of enzymes are they what we call substrate specific. They're going to bind to specific molecules only. And in lecture we described how if we, if we presume this is a globular enzyme, you'll see this little infolding here. And this is what we call the active site or substrate binding site. So we can, we can guess which of these molecules within a cell would be the substrate. And usually folks will pick um, molecule B. And you just kind of intuitively can see that, that molecule B would be able to enter into the active site, the substrate binding site, because it has a complementary shape and size. And if we could see a charge distribution, so the active site truly determines the substrate specificity. The substrate is the molecule upon which the enzyme binds and assists with electron rearrangement. Another tidbit on enzymes is very often they'll end in the ASE ending. So for example, if we talk about lactase, lactase is an enzyme that's going to hydrolyze lactose. <clears throat> Another kind of cool features of enzymes is when the enzyme and the substrate collide, and this is because all the molecules within the, the cell have their own kinetic energy, all the molecules are moving all the time. So when the substrate collides just right with the enzyme, the substrate's going to enter the active site. And what we'll see is the enzyme will actually slightly alter shape so it can bind more tightly to the substrate. And this is referred to as induced fit. Um, in the old days, people wondered, well, is the enzyme-substrate combination more like a lock and key? And think of a lock and key made out of metal, nothing changes shape. But indeed, because the proteins are flexible, they can change shape in this induced fit phenomenon. Many enzymes require, um, we could call them enzyme helpers, or the fancy term, or enzyme cofactors. And some um, cofactors are ions, example, ions of calcium, magnesium, and iron. If the um, specific ions aren't, the specific ions aren't present, the enzyme can't function properly. And then another group of cofactors are the organic cofactors, and we will call these organic cofactors coenzymes. And the only two you need to know for our lecture exam too are NAD and FAD. We call these our electron hydrogen atom carriers. 
This is just a little cartoon on our exams. I never use the term apoenzyme, so don't have to worry about that. But here we're seeing an enzyme combining with its coenzyme. And in this particular case, you can see the coenzyme actually binds to the enzyme and is actually helping to form the active site. So here's the substrate that's going to enter into the active site. And again, folks, I don't use the term holoenzyme either. You, you need not memorize apoenzyme. You need not memorize holoenzyme. I just call call them all enzymes. This is a um, cartoon for um, the interaction between enzyme and substrate. And again, because the enzymes and substrates are all moving constantly within the cell, when the enzyme, the enzyme and the substrate collide at just the right angle, the substrate enters the active site. And then we have what's called the enzyme-substrate complex. This is when the enzyme is helping with electron rearrangements here. So the key thing that, about the enzyme-substrate complex is the enzyme has to have a minimal amount of time to help with electron rearrangement. Okay, so here's our ES complex, and here we see the enzyme has finished with the electron rearrangement. Now the substrate has been converted into product, and so the products are released from the active site. The enzyme... Um, the enzyme returns to its native conformation and then it can enter into another um, um, catal uh, catalyzed reaction. So it can just bind to more substrate and, and the enzyme just continues in a cycle over and over and over again. This is a cool cartoon showing induced fit a little bit more dramatically. Here's a substrate entering the active site and notice how the enzyme changes shape to more tightly bind to the um, substrate, induced fit. And this is our abbreviation for an enzyme catalyzed reaction. E is enzyme, S is substrate. They collide, they form the enzyme substrate complex, and then the substrate is converted to product. Here's our pro product release, and then the enzyme is released unchanged so it can start the reaction all over again. And what will become important later, folks, is to, again, we need we need to uh, remember the enzyme needs a minimal amount of time in the enzyme substrate complex to help with the electron rearrangement. This is just an example of a specific enzyme catalyzed reaction. This is one of the intermediate steps in glycolysis. So you don't have to memorize this, but just so you actually see um, an actual substrate. So here's our enzyme. And again, folks, um, you need not memorize the enzyme names unless I tell you, you know, make sure to memorize this. This one you don't have to memorize. This is one of the enzymes involved in glycolysis, which we'll be discussing in the second PowerPoint, PowerPoint B. This is its substrate, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Bis just means two. So we see the substrate entering the active site. So here we have the enzyme substrate complex. And the enzyme, again, is going to assist with electron rearrangement. And the result is we're going to have our six carbon sugar split into two three carbon intermediates. So these would be our two products here. Here's our products down here. <clears throat> so the products are released from the enzyme. And the, again, the enzyme is not permanently changed, so it can just bind to more substrate. And it can just go round and round and round multiple times, often multiple times a second even. So this is kind of a classic exam question. That is, how is it that enzymes speed up chemical reactions, increase reaction rate? And the classic answer is enzymes lower activation energy. So if we think of substrate, substrates, we think of the electrons, and many of the electrons are in really um, stable, say, um, bonding orbitals. Um, it's going to take an input extra energy to destabilize the electrons to start their rearrangement. And this extra energy required to trigger the electron rearrangement is referred to the, as the activation energy. Normally, activation energy, if there weren't any catalysts, the activation energy would have to be supplied by the kinetic energy of the molecules. And usually, usually at like physiologic temperature, most of the molecules are moving so slowly they don't have enough energy. They don't have that extra activation energy to trigger the electron rearrangement. So as an example, if we look at a graph of energy um, against the progress of the reaction, let's see, these are our reactants. Maybe this is a dimer, okay? And our chemical reaction is we're going to break the covalent bond between the, the two monomers. And our products would be the, the two monomers here. So this is, for example, um, 
uh, hydrolysis reaction. So again, we have to invest this activation energy to trigger the electron rearrangements, right? And then we have breakage of the covalent bond through electron rearrangement and our products have lower energy and this is because um, energy will be released. So the beauty of adding our enzymes is the enzymes bind to the substrate and the enzymes are going to assist with the electron rearrangement. So consequently the substrates need not have so much energy. So what the enzymes do is they are lowering the activation energy. They're reducing the activation energy. So more of the molecules within the cell have sufficient energy to enter into the chemical reaction as long as the enzyme is there to help them. So again, um, enzymes are going to speed up chemical reactions by reducing the activation energy. So here we have the chemical reaction without an enzyme. And you'd see what a large amount of activation energy is required. Here is that same reaction with an enzyme on board. And we see now we have much lower activation energy. Notice that the enzymes don't change the energy um, level of the reactants, nor do the enzymes change the energy level of the products. All they're doing is reducing the activation energy. And that's going to increase the reaction rates. You don't have to memorize this table, it's just to show us that enzymes are classified according to the type of chemical reaction that they catalyze. And do remember here on these enzyme class names where we see that ASE ending that's telling us these are enzymes. Um, this is kind of an important topic and I usually ask one or two questions on um, enzyme activity as it's influenced by temperature or as it's influenced by pH. So let's take a look at these graphs. So this first graph on the y-axis it says enzyme activity. So let's presume this is reaction rate, the number of products per say second. And then um, we're looking at reaction rate as a function of temperature. So we're going to start with low temperature when molecules are moving really slowly. And then as the temperature increases the average kinetic energy, the speed of our molecules is increasing. So we're graphing the reaction rate is the um, temperature moves from really low to really high. Now it does make sense that as we start at a really low temperature, the molecules are moving slowly. We're going to have very few collisions per second between the, um, the enzyme and the substrate. And so we would predict we have a really low uh, reaction rate at low temperatures. And then as the temperature increases, the enzymes and substrates are moving faster, so we're going to have more collisions between the enzyme and the substrate. So it makes sense the reaction rate is going to increase. But, in, but what's happening up here, we have a, a peak, kind of the highest reaction rate, and then suddenly a big decrease. So we might ask, why doesn't reaction rate continue to climb? And we want to remember that enzymes are proteins, so at really high temperature, what happens? they start to denature. And when they denature, they unfold, they lose their functional conformation. And then they can no longer catalyze those chemical reactions. So if I were to ask on the exam, um, at what temperature do we have the maximum reaction rate for this particular enzyme? We're going to guess maybe somewhere, maybe around 37 degrees Celsius. And of interest is that enzymes maximum reaction rate usually reflects the environment in which they evolve. So we would predict this was an enzyme that came from an environment um, that had a temperature of about 37 degrees Celsius. This could be um, an enzyme from a human because that's our core body temperature. Over here again we're graphing reaction rate enzyme activity but this time against pH. So we'll, we'll work this one backwards, you guys. So at what pH does this enzyme have its maximum reaction rate? So it looks like about pH 5, right? Here we want to ask ourselves, why is reaction rate decreasing? Is pH is lowered or pH is increased? And this, again, is a reflection of um, the enzymes or proteins, and they will denature, they will unfold at extremes of pH. So we have enzyme denaturation going this way, we lose functional conformation, so reaction rate goes down. And we also have enzyme denaturation as we're increasing the pH. So the enzyme unfolds, it can't function, reaction rate goes down. 
so it just just reviewing folks that um, all of our enzymes have a specific functional conformation if we denature them they lose their functional conformation um, they unfold and thus they'll lose their function this um, this is kind of a, a bit of a hard topic um, folks and we spent um, some time on it in lecture but let me see if I can't give you the short version so another characteristics of enzymes is what we'll call enzyme substrate saturation so what do we mean by that so we'll look again at another graph this is um, reaction rate number of products per second is a function of substrate concentration so low substrate concentration high substrate concentration and think of this um, as an experiment and let's pretend you guys we only have a single enzyme so we're running this experiment over and over again with a single enzyme and what we're doing is increasing the substrate concentration so it does make sense that at really low substrate concentration um, the enzyme and substrate will rarely collide with one another right so we'll have a really low reaction rate and then as we start let's say doubling the substrate concentration will double the number of collisions between the enzyme and substrate so we'd see an increase in reaction rate and again as we keep increasing substrate concentration we, we would predict more and more collisions between the enzyme and, and the substrate but what's really cool is you'll notice right here right about at this substrate concentration the reaction rate suddenly reaches a plateau and it doesn't matter how much more substrate we add we can't get the reaction rate to increase and it's like what's going on well recall you guys we said that um, the in the enzyme catalyzed reaction the enzyme has to remain bound attached to the substrate for a, a minimal amount of time that enzyme substrate complex the enzyme requires a minimal amount of time to help with electron rearrangements and so what happens is um, when we saturate the enzyme the enzyme is working as fast as it can it cannot work any faster and it doesn't matter if we add more substrate the enzyme is working as fast as it can so we would say right at this point where we, we plateau we kind of level out that would be the substrate concentration um, at which the enzyme is saturated it's working as fast as it can you add more substrate doesn't matter the enzyme can't work any faster and we shared in lecture that this was really cool that physicians um, healthcare providers use this understanding to try to overcome some types of um, antibiotic resistance by bacteria and a classic one is um, we'll, we'll use a historical example our um, our bacterial pathogen Staphylococcus aureus which is um, the king of tissue invaders Staph aureus can be very aggressive um, when um, penicillin was first introduced we were using penicillin like crazy right trying to kill Staphylococcus and other pathogens and Alexander Fleming had warned us if we overuse penicillin we'll select for antibiotic resistant bacteria and he was absolutely right within 10 years of us using penicillin to kill Staphylococcus aureus um, penicillin resistant beta-lactam resistant Staph aureus were being isolated now those first strains of, of um, penicillin resistant uh, beta-lactam resistant Staph aureus it was discovered the mechanism by which the Staphylococcus aureus could grow in the presence of penicillin was that the Staphylococcus aureus was making an enzyme called beta lactam ase there's that ASE ending and in this case the enzyme name is telling us what is the substrate of the enzyme so beta lactamase is a bacterial enzyme that destroys hydrolyzes beta lactam such as penicillin ampicillin and amoxicillin right so this became a huge problem the staphylococcus aureus were making beta lactamase and thus were destroying um, penicillin ampicillin and amoxicillin given to the patients however one strategy that um, um, the healthcare providers used was to try to use enzyme 
su substrate saturation to the patient's advantage. So because the beta-lactams are safe, um, unless you're allergic to them, they're, they're relatively safe antibiotics, what the physicians could do, let's say this is like maybe right here is the normal therapeutic level, say, of, in this case, ampicillin, right? And let's say you're treating a patient with a beta-lactamase producing staph aureus. Well, you can see here at this therapeutic level, right, um, the beta-lactamase is destroying all of the ampicillin, right? So what they did is they said, okay, let's double or triple or quadruple the concentration of ampicillin we give the patient. And let's say we double it, you guys. So that would bring maybe the ampicillin concentration here. And the hope was that the higher levels of ampicillin would overwhelm the beta-lactamase. We would hit this enzyme substrate saturation so that the beta-lactamase, it could not destroy all the ampicillin, right? It was working as fast as it could. There would be extra ampicillin in the patient that wasn't being destroyed. And then that ampicillin could help kill the Staphylococcus aureus. So to me, this is really cool, you guys, by going to a higher dose ampicillin, the hope was the beta-lactamase couldn't destroy all the ampicillin because it was saturated, and then there would be ampicillin that wasn't destroyed that could kill the Staphylococcus aureus. This, folks, is the, the start of a pretty intense topic on enzyme inhibitors. Um, those of you in, in lecture remember it was kind of making our head spin. Um, so again, if you could get out your enzyme inhibitor worksheets, um, I, I made the worksheet because I recognize this is a hard section, and so I wanted you to have the, the worksheet so you can kind of work through it um, at your own pace um, to, to work through the steps of this next unit. Okay, you guys, so just in general, we're going to say there's two different types of enzyme inhibitors, and remember, um, to inhibit means to stop something, um, and inhibitors are substances that are going to stop something from working. So enzyme inhibitors are substances which stop enzymes from working. And we're going to talk about two normal, excuse me, two types of enzyme inhibitors, competitive inhibitors and non-competitive inhibitors. We're going to spend most of our time talking about competitive inhibitors. So let's launch into the competitive inhibitors. So um, competitive inhibitors um, are molecules that are not the substrate of the enzyme but the competitive inhibitor is similar enough to the substrate so the competitive inhibitor can still enter the active site. So here we have the active site of the enzyme. Here the competitive inhibitor is going to enter. And as long as the competitive inhibitor is in the active site, the substrate can't bind. So with the competitive inhibitor in the active site, the enzyme is turned off, right? Well, if a cell was going to make a competitive inhibitor to control its, old en its own enzymes, these competitive inhibitors would always be what we call reversible. They would bind and release, bind and release. However, many of our antibiotics are what we call irreversible competitive inhibitors, and that means when they bind to the active site, the competitive inhibitor forms covalent bonds, and therefore it's permanently blocking the active site. That enzyme is permanently turned off. Now again, we're talking, these are antibiotics. Um, um, antibiotics are substances made by one organism that will inhibit or kill another one. So these antibiotics are toxic for the target organism, right? By permanently turning off these enzymes. Um, this little cartoon down below you guys, this is an example of a reversible competitive inhibitor. It binds and releases, binds and releases. And one of the um, features of reversible competitive in inhibition is it can be overwhelmed or overcome by increasing the substrate concentration. So in this case, you guys, what we have five substrates for every competitive inhibitor. So we could argue that five times out of six, the substrate will enter the active site, right? And only one time out of six, the, the competitive inhibitor would enter. So by increasing substrate concentration, you can over, overcome, overwhelm, reversible competitive inhibition. For the remainder of our um, uh, 
lecture, when we're talking about competitive inhibitors, we're going to talk about the toxic ones, the ones that are irreversible, the ones that form covalent bonds with the enzyme and thus never leave. And again, um, we're going to be using some antibiotics as our example. Okay, so um, many of our antimicrobials, our antibiotics, are irreversible competitive inhibitors of the enzymes of the microbial pathogen. The most famous one is good old penicillin. So penicillin is an irreversible competitive inhibitor of bacterial transpeptidase. Once a penicillin binds to the active site, the bacterial transpeptidase, it forms covalent bonds. It's never leaving. And that means the bacterial transpeptidase is permanently turned off. It can't help form those peptide crosslinks and peptidoglycan. And as a result, the cell wall weakens. And if the cell is growing in a hypoosmotic environment, the cell dies from osmotic lysis, which is what we want to do, right, if the bacterium is causing harm in our patient. So recall, you guys, penicillin was the original beta-lactam discovered by Alexander Fleming. We say that penicillin has relatively narrow spectrum. It's primarily good against gram-positive bacteria. But we said in many gram-negative bacteria, the penicillin can't cross the outer membrane. The penicillin can't cross through the outer membrane porins. So again, we say penicillin is, has relatively narrow spectrum, used primarily against gram-positives. But what... Um, humans did, they took penicillin, they chemically modified it to make amoxicillin and ampicillin. The advantage being that amoxicillin and ampicillin can cross through the porins in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. So amoxicillin and ampicillin have broader spectrum or extended spectrum. They can kill both gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria, right? But, of course, the bacteria are not going to sit back and be killed by these beta-lactams. So you, you will recall we said that once we started using penicillin, we overused it, and we ended up selecting for Staphylococcus aureus that makes this enzyme beta-lactamase that destroys penicillin, ampicillin, and amoxicillin. And this is just a cartoon, folks, of the, um, the chemical structure of penicillin. Here's penicillin. This is the beta-lactam ring, right? We keep talking about beta-lactam antibiotics. They all have this beta-lactam ring right here. And it's, the, it's this beta-lactam ring that the bacterial beta-lactamases hydrolyze. And when the beta-lactamases hydrolyze the beta-lactam ring, the hydrolyzed um, penicillin or ampicillin or amoxicillin cannot bind to bacterial transpeptidase. So the bacteria are, become resistant then. They can grow in the presence of the beta-lactam. This is just the best electron micrograph. These are bacteria before penicillin treatment. These are the bacteria after penicillin treatment, showing the osmotic lysis. These little guys would have been growing in a hypoosmotic environment. Boy, that's dramatic. So um, again, folks, we want to recognize that by overusing the beta-lactams, we selected for Staphylococcus aureus and other bacteria that make these beta-lactamases, enzymes that hydrolyze beta-lactams. And later we'll see you guys, now there's like hundreds of different beta-lactamases. The, the first ones were referred to as penicillinases. Um, for example, the beta-lactamase that Staph aureus made because they hydrolyze penicillin. Also, they would hydrolyze ampicillin and amoxicillin. And what's really unfortunate is very often these beta-lactamase genes are carried on those resistance plasmids. And so bacteria can make multiple copies of their R plasmids and share those resistance plasmids with their neighbors. So this is a way that antibiotic resistance can spread rapidly through populations of bacteria. So this was a challenge to humans, right? Now suddenly our magic bullets don't work because the bacteria are destroying them. So humans took two approaches, you guys, to try to find a solution to deal with these beta-lactamase-producing bacteria. And the first, or I shouldn't say the first, but one of the solutions was, excuse me, they took the penicillin, and once again they tried to chemically modify it to make it so bulky it couldn't fit into the active site of the bacterial beta-lactamase. And this approach worked. I just think it's remarkable. So the... Um, the types of beta-lactams that are resistant to bacterial beta-lactamases are called the beta-lactamase-resistant beta-lactams. Probably 
the most famous one is methicillin, and it's no longer used in the United States. Um, another beta-lactamase-resistant beta-lactam that is used in the United States is oxacillin. The reason methicillin is famous is that with overuse of these beta-lactamase-resistant beta-lactams, we selected for MRSA, and MRSA stands for methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And this is kind of a puzzler because you're like, wait a minute, you know, methicillin isn't destroyed by beta-lactamase. So how, how can Staphylococcus aureus grow in the presence? And this is phenomenal, you guys. So what happened with the use of these beta-lactamase resistant beta-lactams, we selected for mutant Staphylococcus aureus that had a mutant bacterial transpeptidase to which none of our beta-lactams can bind. And what's so wild is the mutant bacterial transpeptidase still functions. It still forms those peptide crosslinks. It's just that none of our beta-lactamases can bind to the transpeptidase active site. So these Staph aureus, they are resistant to all of our beta-lactams. And furthermore, the um, MRSA, often they're carrying um, resistance plasmids that carry genes for multiple antibiotic resistance. So often these MRSA strains, especially those that evolve in hospitals, they're often multiply antibiotic resistant. Really bad news. So again, folks, this is just a cartoon to show the bacterial beta-lactamases would hydrolyze the beta-lactam ring right here. So this is penicillin. And here's that cool methicillin. And notice, you guys, these extra... Um, chemical groups were added here and here. Notice they aren't up here. And this made the methicillin so bulky it can't enter into the active site of the beta-lactamase. And thus we have our beta-lactamase resistant um, uh, methicillin. Now a second approach humans used, and this was really cool, was the thought was could humans discover an irreversible competitive inhibitor of the beta-lactamases. So the inhibitor would bind the active site of the um, beta-lactamase and bind permanently and thus turn off, permanently turn off the bacterial beta-lactamase. And again, you guys, this, the, these stories are so cool. So the, the humans were successful. They discovered a soil microbe belonging to the genus Streptomycetes. And, and folks, this Streptomycetes they are famous for making antibiotics, these soil bacteria. And the streptomycetes made this substance called clavulonic acid. And clavulonic acid, it enters the active site of the bacterial beta-lactamase, forms covalent bonds, so it acts as an irreversible competitive inhibitor of beta-lactamase. The beta-lactamase is turned off, right? And so what what folks first did was they, they took amoxicillin, which is normally destroyed by beta-lactamase, and combined it with clavulonic acid. And they made this combination. The, I think the first, the first combination that came on the market was called Augmentin. So this was so cool. So if you had a patient with a beta-lactamase-producing bacterial pathogen, you gave them Augmentin, the clavulonic acid would inhibit the beta-lactamase and thus protect the amoxicillin, so the amoxicillin could kill the bacteria through um, shutting down the bacterial transpeptidase. So this, this was a really cool strategy, a second strategy that humans evolved to try to outwit those beta-lactamase-producing bacteria. Now, this, to me, folks, this I was late to discover this. Um, when I was going to school and taking my microbiology classes, you know, we, the, the um, instructors would talk about penicillinase or beta-lactamase, and I just thought, okay, there's only one kind. But I was so wrong. I mean, it makes sense, folks, that there's been many, many, many different um, beta-lactamases that have evolved amongst bacteria. Um, some of the beta-lactamases maybe can only maybe destroy penicillin and ampicillin, you know, or amoxicillin. Um, but then there, there are so many beta-lactams um, that, that there are other bacteria that ev evolve beta-lactamases that can destroy a wide range of beta-lactams. And the ones we're really troubled by are... Um, the bacterial enzymes called carbapenemases, which can destroy these 
beta-lactam like um, antibiotics called carbapenem. So let me just walk through this, you guys. This is, I stole this, this, um, this first part out of, out of a really nice pharmacology book. So carbapenems are described as non-conventional beta-lactams. And the reason they're so valuable is they're really broad spectrum. They can kill gram positives and the beauty of them, they're very small. So they can pass through the gram negative outer membrane porin. So they have extended spectrum. They'll kill gram positives and gram negatives. And often killing gram negatives is tough. And this was what further made them fantastic is the carbapenems were resistant to most of the bacterial beta-lactamases that had evolved. Right? And so for a lot of the um, multiple antibiotic resistant gram negative bacterial pathogens and we'll discover you guys there's a big family of gram negative bacteria called Enterobacteriaceae. This is the family to which E. coli belongs. Most of the gram negative bacteria we work with in our lab belong to this big family Enterobacteriaceae. Many of these guys are resistant to multiple antibiotics. So in the old days if you had a, a patient um, suffering with one of these multiply antibiotic resistant Enterobacteriaceae infections, you could always rely on what? On a carbapenem, right? But unfortunately, as you guys are probably predicting, um, the carbapenems got overused. And so we selected for carbapenemase producing um, gram-negative bacterial pathogens. And this, you guys, this carbapenems, carbapenemase, this would be total optional on lecture exam too, because I know this is a lot of information. But some of you perhaps have read about some of these carbapenemases. One of them is called, um, oh, and sorry, there's a typo there, you guys, there should be an M. One of them is called KPC for Klebsiella pneumonia carbapenemase. Another one that's really famous is one of the metallo-beta-lactamases the so-called new Delhi metallo beta lactamases these enzymes now have completed the arsenal of antibiotic resistance genes of many of our gram negative bacteria and with that then we've seen the evolution of true what we call superbugs they are pan resistant pan means they resist all of our antibiotics and so this means truly um, you might encounter patients that have bacterial infections and the bacteria resist all of our antibiotics. There's no antibiotics we can use anymore. And sadly, I think it was about three years ago in Nevada, a woman died of a pan-resistant Enterobacteriaceae. So again, folks, we're always stressing that we need um, stewardship of our antibiotics. We have to make sure we're not overusing them. Um, um, not giving them inappropriately, and um, a, a topic we'll return to is we want to try to reduce the use of antibiotics in animal feed because that's another way we're selecting for antibiotic-resistant bacteria. This, I think, I think you guys, this is the last example of competitive inhibitors that are used as antimicrobials. These are the sulfa drugs and trimethoprim, and they're described as sequential inhibitors of the enzymes bacteria use in folic acid synthesis. Now, folic acid is an important um, part of the coenzymes involved in protein, DNA, and RNA synthesis, right? So we need folic acid, otherwise the bacteria um, won't be able to grow and divide. So humans don't have the enzymes to make folic acid. So folic acid is a vitamin. We have to ingest it, right? But bacteria have um, enzymes to make folic acid, and it goes from, uh, this is paraminobenzoic acid to dihydrofolic acid to tetrahydrofolic acid. You don't have to know these intermediates, folks. But what you do, what I would like you to know is the sulfa drugs, like sulfamethoxazole, they're irreversible competitive inhibitors of one enzyme in this pathway. And then trimethoprim is a, uh, competitive inhibitor of a second enzyme in the pathway. And thus we say they're sequential inhibitors of folic acid synthesis. Very often these drugs are given in combination. So for example, um, the antibacterial called Bactrim is a combination of trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole. And you might say, well, why would you use two? Well, whenever you do combination therapy, for example, if you use two anti 
antibiotics to antibacterials, you greatly reduce the chance that there'll be a spontaneous mutant that will be resistant to both. So by using combination therapy, you're going to reduce the chance of selecting for antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, Nina Howard in the Monday Wednesday section, oh, she brought up a brilliant, brilliant observation and that is pregnant women are, um, um, it's, how should I say this, discouraged pregnant women shouldn't take these sulfa drugs or trimethoprim. They're considered antifolate drugs and what Nina discovered was that if you're pregnant and you take these antifolate drugs, it increases the chance of the baby suffering for spina bifida and other um, other other troubles. And I was thinking about it, I go, but wait a minute, you know, humans, we have to ingest folic acid as a vitamin, so why would these drugs, you know, reduce the levels of folic acid in the human? But folks, I think what it is, is the bacteria in our intestines are making folic acid for us right? And so when they die, we're absorbing their folic acid. So our bacteria in our intestines, I think, are helping to make some of the folic acid that we need. So if we're pregnant and we're taking these anti-folate drugs, shutting down folic acid synthesis in our um, members of our intestinal microbiome, and maybe as a pregnant person, we're not getting enough folic acid in our diet, then that means the, the, the woman would become folic acid deficient, and that can lead to problems for her developing baby. So thanks thanks to Nina for bringing that up. I, to me, that's just so important. We know about you know when these antibiotics are contraindicated, and it's good for us to understand why. So you guys, this last little bit is on non-competitive inhibitors, and um, if we're talking about non-competitive inhibitors, we're talking about allosteric enzymes. So these are special enzymes. They have two binding sites, an active site for a substrate, and then a second binding site that we're going to call the allosteric site. And this is where the non-competitive inhibitor will bind. So the sequence of events is if we have our enzyme and a non-competitive inhibitor binds the allosteric site, it causes the protein, the enzyme, to change shape. And as a result, we're going to change the shape of the active site. And as a result, the substrate can't bind. I know this is pretty subtle, you guys, but you can see this active site, these grooves are pretty big and here we have the non-competitive inhibitor bound and you can see the active site um, that one groove is a lot smaller so the substrate can't bind and um, non-competitive inhibitors cells will make non-competitive inhibitors co to control the activity of enzymes they've made but always you guys if a cell makes an inhibitor remember it's always reversible it binds releases binds and releases and binds and releases so where cells will use these non-competitive inhibitors is in a phenomenon called feedback or end product inhibition. So feedback end product inhibition. So to understand this phenomenon, we need to first describe what we mean by a metabolic pathway. And a metabolic pathway is where we have um, at least two chemical reactions which are catalyzed by two different enzymes. And the by definition, the um, product of the first chemical reaction, enzyme catalyzed reaction. So you guys, oops, sorry, you guys. Let's say this is the initial reactant. Here's our enzyme. And let's say this is um, reactant A. This is enzyme little a. So enzyme little a turns reactant A into some end product B. And then to make this a metabolic pathway, we have to have a second enzyme, little b, that binds to that what was the end product, um, B binds to B and converts it into, um, oops, sorry, it's here, A to B. Okay, this would be, um, an, for example, an enzyme of the, um, excuse me, the end product of the second enzyme catalyzed reaction here. Okay, and, and indeed, here you guys, this is actually, um, in this metabolic pathway, there's actually three enzymes involved. So here's the first enzyme, there's the, um, Oh, I see. I screwed this up horribly, you guys. So this this is substrate. First enzyme converts it to this end product A. A becomes the substrate for a second enzyme here, converting it to B. B becomes the substrate for a third enzyme here. And then here's our end product. So uh, apologies, you guys. I described the figure incorrectly. 
So in feedback or end product inhibition, this end product can act as a non-competitive inhibitor to the first enzyme in the pathway. So look, check out this first enzyme, you guys. See how it's an allosteric enzyme? It has a non-competitive inhibitor binding site and a substrate binding site here. So if for any reason the cell accumulates a lot of this end product, the end product feeds back to that first enzyme, binds to the allosteric site, triggers the enzyme to change shape, so now it can't bind to its substrate. And what that does, it shuts the whole pathway down. Right? And you might say, why does the cell want to do that? Well, as biologists, we believe that resources are usually limiting for organisms. So that a cell that is wasteful, you know, wasteful of um, organic molecules or wasteful of energy, that cell chances of surviving will be lower than a cell that is conservative, right? Is not wasteful, doesn't waste energy, doesn't waste organic molecules. So feedback or end product inhibition is a way for an organism to shut down metabolic pathways, um, the products of which it doesn't need anymore, right? So this is awesome. The end product then inhibits the first enzyme. The whole pathway shuts down, saving resources. But because these NCIs, non-competitive inhibitors, are reversible, if for some reason the concentration of this end product decreases, the NCIs release the first enzyme, the enzyme um, regains its functional conformation, and then the pathway becomes active again. So we'll start making that end product. So this is a really lovely way for cells to control the activity of their enzymes and their metabolic pathways so they aren't wasteful. And that's the end, you guys, of the PowerPoint A, kind of our introduction. And then the second PowerPoint, PowerPoint B, is on specific metabolic pathways. So we'll be talking about glycolysis. We'll be talking about fermentation. Um, we'll talk about aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration. We'll talk about anoxygenic photosynthesis, oxygenic photosynthesis, and we'll finish with a description of the nitrogen cycle. Okay, folks.